good afternoon, Campus Euros. Uh, welcome also for me to Campus Party 2016, already the fourth edition of Campus Party Europe. Um, I hope you still have a lot of energy after lunch, no after lunch dip here. Welcome to the Netherlands if you're visiting us from abroad. Who of the audience is actually from outside the Netherlands? Hands? Special welcome. Uh, and of course, welcome to this digital entertainment and media stage. Uh, my name is Brecht Sidelei, and I will be your host and moderator during the talks uh, on this stage uh, today, but also the upcoming days. Uh, I work as a mobile strategist for my own company, Be Digitized. I help companies transforming their business to this mobile age. So uh, mobile is my first love, but I uh, also love all the tech innovations you see out there. I've been in a Google Glass Explorer for over a year walking around in public with the geekiest of the variable family. That was fun. I have a smartwatch, a small drone, and a Google Cardboard for the affordable uh, version of, uh, of VR. So I'm basically all into the new technologies, and uh, so as all of you, because you've joined an event that's all about technology and innovation. Well, and this stage actually features a lot of very interesting talks. We have talks on virtual reality, gaming, drones, digital media trends, and much, much more. So stick around these days. Um, the theme of this track today is the power of social. So of course, the use of social media is part of the experience. Use hashtag CPEU4, digital entertainment. If you want to share stuff uh, outside. Um, of course, there's free Wi-Fi, no password. If it's up, just join it and you are ready to share. Uh, please set your phone to silent, so although you can share information, the, the speakers are not disturbed by all the notifications you get in. Uh, that helps. And leave it a bit alone when they're talking, because this, the image of the top of your head, is not so nice if they share their story with you. So that's for all the practical stuff. Um, like I said, this stage is all about the new technologies for digital entertainment. And uh, I think the hottest topic in tech today is virtual reality. We had already a lot of challenges about virtual reality on the stage, and now two speakers on this topic. Uh, starting off today, and he's already working his presentation, uh, is Robin de Lange. He works as a researcher, uh, lecturer, uh, entrepreneur, focused on virtual reality and education. So we see a lot of the big entertainment companies like Google, Facebook, etc., investing a lot in VR. So the entertainment industry is fully invested, but what's actually in it for you as a student? Uh, Robin will focus in his talk uh, about basically uh, how VR can actually help learning. So I'm really curious uh, about his story. Welcome Robin to the stage. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. And uh, as Brechtje already mentioned, I'm my focus is really on virtual reality and learning. So I think it's kind of ironic that I'm here on the digital entertainment stage as I'm interested in all the uses VR has. Uh, that, that's not the entertainment uh, uh, business, actually. Um, OK, but today I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, my research on, uh, on VR and education. But let's first, to get an idea of the audience, how many people have never ever experienced uh, a VR experience. Still a few. Okay, that's if you walk into that area, it's hard to to miss any Oculus Rift headsets or or stuff like that. But okay, unfortunately, perhaps you don't exactly know what I'm talking about today. And who has ever uh, created anything for uh, virtual reality? Has ever created any content? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Okay. So my let me first introduce myself. My name is Robin de Lange, and I'm. Uh, 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 let me start. What I uh, I have a background in physics uh, and, uh, and philosophy. I started doing some extra courses on artificial intelligence, and after that, I uh, I went to the um, media technology master program. In that program, there's a program that's really focused on cre uh, asking small scientific questions and learning the tools to answer them yourself. Uh, and I had a focus on extended cognition and augmented reality. And the idea of extended cognition is that uh, the way we use technology in the way we solve problems is so intense that we can actually see, it, uh, see uh, certain tools as extensions of our minds, which is a fascinating uh, idea, I think. 
So I started working with, uh, with Unity a lot, and this is an augmented reality project I created with a fellow student to give you an ID. So this here, in this you use your phone uh, to scan children's books, and then now you see a sort of opinion cloud with all, uh, uh, this is a way to navigate through all the uh, reviews that other children um, left, uh, wrote about the book. We created this for a contest, but there was unfortunately no direct funding, so um, the project was discontinued. Was it, it taught me a lot, however. Uh, so, and during my studies, uh, I also had a, a tutoring company, so we provided tutoring and homework guidance for, uh, for many students in, uh, in the De Hague area. And so during my work, I, I gained a lot of interest in education. How, uh, how can we improve education and how can we, uh, teach, uh, how can we teach better? So I was also involved with the video production of the first MOOC of the Netherlands, uh, made, in, made at Leiden University on uh, European law. And in my graduation project, I sort of combined these interests in uh, augmented reality extended cognition and, uh, and education. And I created this uh, augmented reality application. It is a prototype, it doesn't actually work, but it was, uh, I made this to raise, to raise questions about what it would be like if you, had, if you have an augmented reality app that solves all sorts of mathematical problems for you. And how does that change the way we solve problems, but also how should that change the way uh, uh, how should it change the way, the things we teach at school? Should you still learn how to do uh, long division with pen and paper? Or should we teach children how to make use of an application like this? Okay, so after this I wanted to uh, continue doing research and I wrote a PZ proposal. Uh, I became a PZ researcher, part-time PZ researcher. Um, um, at Media Technology, Bas Haring is my uh, promoter. Uh, and at the same time, I also started doing all sorts of freelance uh, projects, like the uh, largest projects I'm involved, uh, largest project I'm involved in now is the Liceo Code Lab, and there we teach uh, hundreds of uh, high, school high school children how to code. Okay, so I started doing research and my focus was on augmented reality and education. Uh, but then in 2013, the Oculus Rift came out and it actually, from that, I was so impressed with it and it, uh, that I actually decided to change my focus of research a bit. Um, and I bought an Oculus Rift in 2014, was really impressed with the results and started just playing around with it, uh, making small applications for it in Unity. And, but it was time for a real project then. And a good occasion for this came by uh, as I joined the Hack the Brain Hackathon. It was organized uh, by Waag Society in Amsterdam. It was a three-day during event, three-day event, and uh, the participants were challenged to hack the human brain. Uh, and the Waag arranged EEG scanners and a lot of neuroscientists to help you with the equipment. Um, and our project was a, uh, a live visualization of the data from the EEG scanner in an Oculus Rift uh, uh, setting. So you would wear an EEG head cap with all these electrodes on it, and you also wore a, 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 a Oculus Rift and you, were, you find yourself standing in an enormous model of a brain, and in, the, in this brain you actually see visualizations of the uh, brain activity at these certain electrodes. Now, EEG scanners are not, wondrous, are not the most wonderful devices. It's really hard to get me, uh, meaningful uh, data from this, but you could definitely see when you relax then, the, then, then certain parts of, you, of your brain uh, uh, had actually uh, increased, in, increased in activity in uh, alpha waves. What's kind of cool. So I changed my focus of research and my, uh, my for the past year or so, my focus has been on these uh, research questions. In what ways can we use VR as a tool uh, for learning? And what are the obstacles and opportunities for implementing VR in the field of education? Now let me first take a quick st uh, step back. Uh, Avinash also mentioned something about the history of VR, but let me get over, go over some of the things uh, really quickly. Uh, so the, the main thing is that virtual reality is not new. 
Uh, there was already, in, in 1955, this is the Sensorama. It has uh, 3D, white vision, color, uh, but also aromas and wind. And this has never got, uh, the, the, the guy who made this never received funding, so only a few hundred people ever uh, experienced this wonderful machine. Now this is, uh, this is the first head-mounted display in 1961. This, is a, this shows a live stream from a, from a camera system. And here in 1989, this is actually the first commercial head-mounted display. Uh, and this is actually, this has already all the elements the Oculus Rift uh, has as well. It shows computer-generated images uh, in a head-mounted display and it measures your head movement to correct, uh, to show, the, to show different, different images. Now, then in the, in the 90s, there was this whole VR hype. I have a video about this, but uh, internet is uh, failing, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and there was this VR hype, and people had great ex expectations. Uh, VR was going to change the world completely. And that's sort of the... the uh, so we were at the, at the hype cycle really at the top. And then there was about the same time when the Nintendo Virtual Boy came out, this horrible device which gave you headaches and only used red and black monochrome displays. Um, and that, that was a commercial, fa commercial failure. But it also led to the to the to the setting of the disappointment. The promises that were made in the in the VR hype could not be fulfilled. So after that, uh, after that, we enter actually enter an interesting approach of the hype cycle, where uh, the consumer doesn't believe anymore, uh, doesn't believe in VR anymore, doesn't believe uh, in the technology. But uh, uh, progress is definitely being made in small uh, small high budget applications like. Big oil companies were creating simulations for uh, uh, for um, for finding new oil fields in enormous in enormous caves, uh, machines that cost hundreds of million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, to find these new uh, new sources of so sources of oil. And then in 2012, the uh, the Oculus came out. The Oculus Rift had had their Kickstarter campaign. And what, what's really set them, what really set the Oculus Rift apart is that it reintroduces virtual reality to the general consumer because it, it only cost three, it costed only 300 euros and it was way better than what was available uh, at the time. Now, Google Cardboard takes this even a step further for, t for 10 euros and a smartphone you already own, you can experience uh, uh, somewhat low quality uh, virtual reality experiences. And now dozens of headsets are on the market, uh, or hundreds, and, and perhaps even thousands are, being, uh, are coming, uh, coming anytime soon. So state of the art is, so we have sort of two fields. You have the uh, desktop VR, which is powered by desktop. Uh, it's s quite expensive. You have to have a thousand euro computer. And uh, now, well, an Oculus Rift costs about 900 euros. An HTC Vive is about the same. It has the best performance, but it only has a small target group, mainly gamers. And then we have the mobile VR, uh, which is af quite affordable, I guess. Okay performance, uh, and probably will have a, a broad target group. 